So today I want to talk about company towns. Company towns are towns that are controlled by a company or an industry. And usually they are either through an intentional community in which maybe a company buys land around a resource and they incentivize people to move in, or it's when a town is literally bought up by one uh, entire industry. Now, these usually mean that the company or industry that owns the territory owns everything. They own the housing, they own the utilities, in many cases they own the stores at which you purchase things. There is just generally speaking a very monopolistic control of the environment. And it's not difficult to see how that would create a, you know, historical precedent where, you know, these company towns have been quite nasty towards labor, people, workers, and generally speaking, rights of people in the United States. So that said, company towns are becoming relevant again. And it just never ceases to amaze me how much the capital class will change and twist every single concession it has given up to again try to reach a place where they eventually reach monopolistic power over people's lives and turn back time to convince people that the times when hierarchical control and the attempt to privatize more aspects of life were prioritized over people's needs, that will keep going and doing this over and over again. You know, with the many setbacks to labor and how exploited some people have been, in how many areas of the country are really in poor economic situations right now, it's unsurprising that the capital class has taken these strides towards reforming company towns. And one example of this is actually in Nevada, where we have discovered that Nevada is proposing a bill that would allow tech companies to create governments. Now, the story behind this is that the Democratic governor, Steve uh, Sisolak, announced a plan to launch a so-called innovation zone in Nevada. This innovation zone would be planned to jumpstart the state's economy by attracting tech firms um, into the state. These zones would permit companies with large areas of land to form governments, carrying the same authority as counties, including the ability to impose taxes, form school districts, courts, and provide government services. If this doesn't scare you, the idea that a private company that who, that is incentivized to make money off of people would be in charge of taxes, school districts, courts, and public services, then I don't know if this is going to reach you. But that is a scary proposition because the companies involved will essentially control all of the public services that people use on a daily basis on a for-profit model. If you don't, like, there's a clear conflict of interest in that model in and of itself, where you're supposed to provide for people by exploiting them for their money and resource. And, you know, this is all being done as, quote, an alternative form of local government. And this comes in contrast to a lot of the models that a lot of other places have used, which is to provide tax incentives for places like Amazon to come in and build factories and warehouses to kind of create jobs in certain communities. So I think what Nevada's trying to do on some level is create a situation where the company's paying for things and the company's providing the services. And, you know, it ends up making the state make a lot of money. But this doesn't work. Uh, this has never worked. And this is going to cause a lot more harm than good in the long run. Uh, the draft proposal said that the traditional local government model is inadequate alone to provide the resource to make Nevada a leader in attracting and retaining business and fostering economic development in emerging technologies and industries. So with that said, um, you know, this is worth talking about because the history of company towns, quite like what is being described in Nevada, where they have logistical control over the entire, uh, you know, town and can control rules and regulations, such as literally laws and public services, has again been one that's been almost exclusively abusive and paternalistic. Um, and again, the workers are the ones who suffer. Even in the most positive attempts 
at a utopian business society, such as in Pullman, Chicago, which is famous for the Pullman strikes. The workers eventually got the short end of things and found themselves at the mercy of capitalism, specifically capital backed by state power. So I want to talk more about this Nevada Innovative Zone, and I want to explore some of the history with that in terms of certain uh, company towns that have existed and kind of draw the parallels between the two narratives, between the current stories and the history, and kind of just showcase how bad of an idea this is. And I'll try to throw in some of the logic and reasoning within all of that. So with that said, let's take a look at what actually goes in to an innovative zone in Nevada under this proposed plan. Now, keep in mind that this is not set in stone at the moment. This is just being proposed. It ha the bill hasn't even been fully written, but this is the premise behind what a bill might look like at the moment. So the proposal by Blockchain LLC would create essentially an autonomous district that functions as a county within a county. Again, it takes over all of the county government positions, like schooling and everything else. Such zones could only be created by a private developer who owns a certain amount of land, has a certain amount of position, and, you know, is going to innovate technology. So we've seen this before, where a person, where a company comes in and is innovating technology, railroad industry, coal industry, steel industry, and comes in with the plan of saying, well, we're going to make this town great. We're going to produce jobs. We're going to produce all of this money and wealth and resource. And the state now gets kickbacks from this. They are getting a decrease in the amount they have to spend because they don't have to spend for public services on certain things. Furthermore, they're going to get taxes and revenue from this uh, blockchain company, which means the state will back the company, not the people. The state has no incentive to back up the needs of people. Furthermore, in this particular case, uh, we run into a situation where, again, innovative technology is the forefront of the process, and that's the exact same model that we saw back in the 19th century and um, early 20th century with the creation of industries that were around even things like automotive industry and just the production of new technologies to move the society forward. We are literally repeating history here. So uh, blockchain already envisions developing Painted Rock Smart City, which over, 70, over a 75 year period would include an estimated 36,000 permanent residents. So they do have the incentive to create a town here. Renderings in these documents illustrate space age style silver buildings in the style of uh, Frank Getry set in rolling brown hills of northern Nevada. The smart cities envision to eventually employ one in 50 Nevadans and account for nearly 2% of all wages produced in the state. Now, that's a large chunk of people, and that could expand even more if this proves fruitful at first, with more companies coming in and literally buying up sections of the state to employ people. You might actually see a movement towards this as a larger model if this starts working at first. And the thing is, it working at first also has historical precedent, like I talked about with Pullman. So here's how um, the proposed innovation zone concept would work. First, a company would submit to the government's office, they'd get the approval, they'd show that they have the acreage, the land, and all that stuff. And if approved by the state, an innovation zone would then create and uh, given authorities typically created by local government bodies. There would be a county commission, um, you know, of or municipality in charge. It would be led by a three-member board of supervisors, all appointed by the governor, though two must be appointed from a list of five applicants provided by the innovation zone applicant, and none can have a, a pecuniary interest in the applicant or a commitment in private capacity to the interests of the applicant. So basically what that's saying is in theory, there's supposed to be some sort of system of checks and balances that protects the company's interest and the uh, interests of the state and everybody there. But what's missing there is the fact that the workers who will likely live in the town don't have a say in this situation. The governor picks it, 
and this is hand-picked representatives, three of them hand-picked by the governor, that would represent uh, two of them being in the interest of the company. And even though they can't have financial ties and direct commitments to the company, that doesn't mean they can't have some sort of, you know, backdoor deals or ties to the company, which means two thirds of that grouping will be in favor of the company. The third one probably wouldn't be too expensive to buy out. And that means the company would maintain control. And if you think I'm talking cynically, this happens all the time. This is how graft works. This is how you end up getting, um, you know, companies to buy up towns. This is how it has happened historically. You buy the politicians off. And these aren't even politicians because they're not even elected officials. The people can't say, oh, you know what? I want to get rid of those three people. They can change the governor, but I don't know what influence that'll have on the actual on the ground situation if the three people have already been appointed. We don't know the full rules around it, so I'm not going to harp on that much more. But that's a glaring oversight. And the people have no control over who's running their own town. So once the transition is complete, the innovation zone is no longer subject to county ordinances. The proposed bill language specifies that the any reference to county in Nevada law would also include Carson City and the innovative zone, which means the innovative zone would literally become a county in its own right uh, within Carson City. So it would not be subject to county ordinances, which means it's also responsible for having its own legislative body and creating its own set of laws and regulations. Now, do you think a for-profit industry is going to have incentive to, I don't know, raise the minimum wage or make sure people have a living wage or maybe rent control or provide utilities or anything of that sort or provide any needs for poor people? No, they are specifically creating a worker utopia community in which they benefit. The utopia aspect is specifically for the company's interests. Don't let that confuse you. In a for-profit model, that will always be the case. A blockchain's proposed industry-specific tax through the innovative zone would be based on transactions using stablecoin, a kind of cryptocurrency that aims to achieve price stability by being backed by a reserve asset. It can be pegged to a currency like the dollar or something like gold, and blockchains envisions creating its own kind of stablecoin to serve painted rock and eventually the world. So I just need to draw a comparison here. Historically speaking, when you had company towns, company towns usually came with a company store. And I'm going to go into more details about that. But in the company store, the company store would run on script, which was basically an IOU. It was an alternative currency to the US dollar that would basically only be able to be spent within the company store and the company town meaning you essentially had monopolistic control over how people spent. Does anybody see a glaring flaw in the idea of a blockchain company wanting to use a cryptocurrency to incentivize its business model owning a town? Because my brain immediately goes to the idea that eventually that cryptocurrency is going to end up becoming the new script. It's going to become the new currency that is used exclusively within the town and is going to end up being a tool of manipulation and control. Because if you can only pay your rent in um, stablecoin, you end up making more money off of your own currency that will essentially be inflated in value just by the fact that everybody has to have it to survive. And if you can buy into more and more companies... Uh, you know, using this coin and incentivize it, you might create the illusion of some sort of free market, but it'll end up boosting the company's profits in the long run. There is an incentive for them to make all of their workers take and accept the stable coin or any type of cryptocurrency that they back. And that is a huge, huge power problem. It'll just raise their value. It'll raise their markets, just like the rent situation, just like the property value, just like everything else that's going to go into a company town. It is exclusive monopoly control over people's lives at the cost of people. And before I go into the history, 
Uh, I just want to point out that Nevada is not the only place considering ideas like this. As a matter of fact, Menlo Park in uh, California has been doing this with the Facebook community for a few years. They've been planning the 59 acre site that they have there in which, again, the most likely tenants of the full price units are going to be the Facebook employees who will receive five figure bonuses if they live near the office. And I need to point that out as well. Companies will always set these snares. They will always incentivize people to move into the towns. And it's a common abuse tactic. You know, a lot of these companies in Silicon Valley are very much anti-union. They are against uh, labor. You know, just as a general principle, we've seen it with Amazon, we've seen it with Google, we've seen it with Microsoft, we've seen it, you know, in every single tech company. They are anti-union. Uh, Facebook and Twitter as well. You know, and so you now have a situation where you're setting honey. You're drawing the honey in with the literal honey pot. This is a snare. This is how you draw people in. And the second they step into the honey, they end up finding after time that honey isn't so sweet and they're actually stuck. And the New York Times in the article that I was showing off actually pointed that out. As workers begin to literally live at the office, they will inevitably be more beholden to bosses, who will also collect rent. After all, it is much harder to find a place to live in Silicon Valley than a new job. Turnover may slump, so might the turnover in ideas. So yeah, you're going to keep people stuck there because if you control their rent, you control the prices. You control how much they make, you control how much they pay out. You can keep people stuck in a certain level of economic affluence or poverty, and you can control whether or not they can move in and out. That is the recipe for an abusive situation. That is a recipe for a labor problem. That is a recipe for the for this company to control people's lives. And the only way to deal with that has ever been a union. And so getting into some of the history, um, you know, the New York Times pointed out often these places, the company towns like this, were places of exercise in plunder. In Textile Town in Lowell, Massachusetts in 1846, the mill clock was actually slowed down to lengthen shifts and then sped up at night when the workers were off. Um, steel built Gary, Indiana. Uh, U.S. Steel built Gary, Indiana, but took little responsibility for its employees, many of who lived in lived in substandard housing and crime-ridden neighborhoods, what would be considered slums. So, you know, this is the history there. And yes, that is actual truth. There were towns in which the mill clock was slowed down to either extend the workday or pay less wages. And then the towns would speed up the clock during the nighttime. So employers were able to force their employees to work more. Now that kind of thing might not work in the modern era, but that doesn't mean alternative tactics won't be developed that are adapted to them, such as using technology to exploit people and make sure they're working all the time because you literally have control and can watch them and monitor them to a much greater degree. So the next one I wanna focus on is a Stone Mountain Coal Company where you had mine workers. Um, on May morning in 1920, a train pulled into a town in Kentucky, West Virginia border. Its passengers included a small army of private security guards who had been dispatched to evict the families of striking workers at a nearby coal mine. And so that's another risk, right? If you're working in a company, you get fired from said company, you're renting from said company, you now have no alternative to you know, housing, they can just come in and evict you with their own private police force that they paid for. Your kids going to those schools, you no longer have access to. You are beholden entirely to the company with no alternatives, no choices, and no freedom. And so the only alternative is to strike, and striking is what people did. Um, miners located outside the city limits uh, rented homes that were owned by their employer, shopped at a general store that was owned by their employer, and paid in a company-generated form of cash that could only be spent at the company store. When they joined a United Mine Workers organizing drive and struck for better pay, they were fired and blacklisted. You can expect a certain type of thing like that to happen in a lot of these communities. And just because some of the people there are making five-figure and six-figure salaries right now, you're going to need workers to come in and serve them. You're going to need a community. You're going to need storefronts. You're going to need small businesses. 
eventually they will evolve into full-blown towns. And even if you get a case where there's a class distinction within the town, you'll end up getting an underclass that will end up being the people who cannot unionize and cannot form under that town umbrella. And, you know, I'm still waiting for when a town like the one in Nevada starts contracting out and being like, oh, we'll license certain stores to come in that agree with our union positions or agree with our perspectives. The business class, the capital class, will always defend its own first. And so without a work union, a workplace can be a dictatorship, and it often is. But what if your boss is also your landlord, your grocer, your bank, and your local police? And in these instances, the schools, everything else, they provide your utilities. Can you imagine a company being able to shut down your water because you didn't show up to work or you missed a shift? That's absurd. That is an absurd amount of power to let somebody have over you. That kind of 24-7 employer domination used to be common practice before the labor movement and the New Deal order brought it to an end. And then we have another story in New England where you had come um sorry you had another story around new england with clothing manufacturers um where company housing in the early 1800s took over you also had during the industrial revolution industries where the work was necessarily physically remote like coal mining and logging where the companies bought all the land bought all the resources bought all the tools bought everything and then force people to come in. And in early coal mines, I just need to point this out, workers were actually forced to buy their own materials and tools. If your tool broke, if your pickaxe broke, if whatever, you know, your mining lamp or your canary died, you had to go get a new one. And that was on your cost. You borrowed it from the company. You were not compensated. You were not given resources. You were not given materials. And this is exactly where the capital class would like to take us back to. Because that's where they make the most money, that's where they concentrate the most wealth. Life was even more miserable for workers where the company store prevailed. Employers would own and operate a general store to sell the basic necessities to workers with as much as 20% markup. An 1881 Pennsylvania state investigation into Union Buster and a uh, future walking head wound Henry Clay Frick's Coke Company found that the company cleared $160,000 in annual profits from its company store. They're going to make money off of everything. They're going to find ways to incentivize making money off of everything, whether it's the stores, the housing, the schools, the police, the jails that they'll eventually have to build, anything in the town. If they own it, they're going to make money off it. That's what a for-profit model does. That's the incentive in capitalism, and that's why it doesn't work. You are competing with your own interests. You are competing with the idea of your own workers' interests and the idea of a community. That doesn't work. That is hierarchical power at its worst. Some employers uh, paid their employees in the company script, which I mentioned before, and uh, they could be fired if they were caught bargain hunting at an independent store in a neighboring town. And payday was often so meager and delayed that workers would have to buy on credit. Furthermore, if somebody, you know, was not able to afford to pay their debt, there were alternative ways to pay debt, which often came at the detriment of women. And I will just leave that at that, and you can read between the lines on that. The women would have to make up what the men couldn't pay back for. And that didn't mean just going into the coal mines. So the textile giant uh, Cannon Mills had run a company town actually until the 1980s when the company was purchased and leveraged in a buyout, and the new owners just decided to sell the 2,000 houses. So even if this ends up being relatively successful and people stay in for an extended period of time, there's always a possibility that in 70 years the company sells off to somebody else and they decide to sell all the housing and people just lose their homes. This is the power of, you know, controlling people through rent and being landlords. People need to own their properties. And uh, then we come into the Pullman area, and why uh, Pullman is so important is within their structure, he actually built a well-stocked library, he built a luxury hotel, he built a licensed bar, he built a grand theater, he tried to make it a great community with a giant church and a great facilities and all this other stuff, and it pulled people in, quite like I said before, like a fly to honey, you know, you know you end up in the honey trap. And even though they weren't forced to work there and many commuted from Chicago, there were incentives in place for you to come in, not just from the community grounds, 
but from financial kickbacks. And then the 12,600 Pullman employees did choose to live in this town by 1893. Uh, some were supervisors, some were social climbers, many were young workers who wanted to raise their families. This, it was considered a healthy city, it had a low death rate, but he ran the place like a business because that's what a business is going to do. So eventually he started charging library membership fees uh, to create personal responsibility. He started having his, uh, you know, the workers started avoiding the hotel bar because the hotel bar was being watched by off-duty supervisors. See how this quickly devolves into a place of control? Um, it limited public um, a carousing to neighboring villages. You know, you basically had situations where people started being monitored and watched. And in a surveillance society where that's already a thing, where we can check your data, check what you're doing online, can you imagine that extending to your phone, to your, you know, your laptop, your computer, whatever technology you're using, what you're watching? If you start even looking up unions, you can start getting, you know, comments from your boss like, hey, I saw that you at this IP address that we actually have an address to, um, you were doing this. This is what we saw you doing. And if you want to continue working at our place of employment and making anything, you're going to stop looking up unions. And if you even think about talking about a union, this is what's going to happen to you. So the housing too was for rent only. And within the Pullman situation, the, uh, there was an economic downturn in 1893. And the company cut wages but kept their rent high. And this forced people to quit. And this is one of the more beneficial situations historically. And the strike was violently crushed by the National Guards and its leaders were jailed. Uh, you know, in, in many other cases, laid off workers were just violently evicted by Pinkertons or other local police that were paid for by the company or neighboring state officials. And so that's really the point. The state is going to back this up because as I've shown, the state's getting kickbacks from this and it all loops full circle. And this is the model of how capitalism works. It's just, we're able to see it in a microcosm. We're able to see how this institution that affects a grand society uh, works on a small level and small scale. And this is one of the reasons why I think people need to become radical to the left and need to start moving in that direction. Because without at least unions, without at least some syndicalization, without some sort of movement towards economic justice for people and the ability of people to democratically control their workplaces, this is what's always going to happen. And the state does not protect people. It will always protect its financial interests and its own preservation by backing companies. We have seen this. We have seen this before and we need to watch out. And so with that said, this is what we can expect from company towns like the one in Nevada. It will control people's lives and that will inevitably lead to people's suffering under a capitalist business model with for-profit incentives for as much things as possible. There might be, you know, a difference in certain uh, internal communities and it might look better at first, but it's not going to be in the long run. And these, again, would look better if things were democratically controlled. If you had an intentional community where a bunch of people got together and they all democratically controlled their workplace and chose their representatives and chose who was running the facility, and it was actually an elected town, uh, we'd be talking about something very different. There would be a level of, you know, worker control over things and people being in charge of their own livelihoods and future. But that is not the case in these company towns at all. It's a very right-wing capitalist idea. And this puts the CEO as lord of a serfdom. They are literally the kings of their own respective castle. And these towns are, again, not likely to be very different from what we've experienced previously. The state will back things up. And everything will incentivize the company and profit over the needs of people. People will suffer in these towns. It's an inevitability. We've seen it before. History is repeating itself, and it should not go forward. With that said, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button and bell for notifications. You can follow me on Twitter and check out my Discord in the description down below. My name is Anarchist Tara, and I hope you enjoyed watching.